do. Um, and so what that allows you to do is um, for this particular database, uh, for this particular database, is it allows you to create an alert um, for the search, which I love because let's say I'm uh, preparing to do some kind of a topic on, I don't know, alternate energy sources or something for a science class. And so, you know, we've talked about it from a factual point of view in the class and I want kids to maybe explore some different uh, resources, different sources, think about, um, you know, whether wind power is good for Canada or geothermal or what have you. And so, we've gone and looked at some articles. Uh, I get a, a series um, that comes up in my search, so the Canadian magazines, Canadian newspapers and stuff. And so I'm developing my lesson around what I found. But I think to myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this two weeks from now. And so I just want to make sure that I'm getting really the most current articles that I can. So I can actually create an alert for the search that I've done. The search I've done is on, you know, alternate energy. And so because I have an account on the EBSCO server, I click on the create alert for the search it will allow me to um, choose whether I want to be alerted over the next month or alerted over the next uh, three months or the next six months or the next year. And anytime anything new is added to this kind of search, I don't have to go back and run the search again. It will simply send me a link so that I can come and look at the most recent material. Uh, now, I don't know how often you would use that, but, but depending on the topic and the grade level and all that kind of stuff, you know what, this is, I think this is a great little plus. And for students who are doing, senior students who are doing a project on something here, to be able to get an email reminder when a new article comes out means that the presentation they're going to do allows them to pull up an article that was in the paper today and say, oh, this just in. Uh, you know, some company is doing wind power or something. It, it makes their work seem much more relevant and much more up to date. Um, I put a little link in here to a, a little tutorial on how to go about creating an account on EBSCO. So it's uh, it's really quite a simple process, and uh, yeah, it's a great feature. Another thing I like is uh, the research guides. So uh, whenever you do a search, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you'll see in the upper right hand corner of the search a little uh, box that says research guides and they give you the first four or so off of the off of their list writing a, a thesis statement judging fact and opinion etc so these are one or two page articles that walk students through uh, whatever these things are now just pasted down below some additional topics so it gives some steps on how to give an oral presentation, uh, how to cite your sources or create a bibliography, how to write a research paper, uh, how to understand stand bias. Uh, I think there's actually a dozen different things. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's I think there's some good things here. Um, okay, let me just scroll down a little bit further. So the articles themselves, and uh, I, I see the, the question here about the grades 5 plus, I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, um, uh, the articles are available either in HTML full text or in PDF full text, and sometimes you'll have them available in both formats. So here's, a, here's an example uh, of an article. So I've, I've chosen uh, the magazine tab, and this is you know, one of the many choices that has come up. So uh, Energy's Prevailing Winds, uh, it's from the American Spectator magazine gives me the date, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you'll notice that it uh, gives the uh, a link for the HTML full text and a link for the PDF full text. So if I choose the PDF full text, it'll give me the page scanned out of the magazine as if I have the magazine right in front of me. So in some cases, the text features and things in the magazine article are important for understanding what's going on. There might be an illustration or a picture or something like that or a diagram that you might want to preserve. And so you could post the link to that PDF full text on a class web page. Uh, students, by clicking on that link from home, they would be able to then put in their login credentials in order to get to the article. Um, you could print the PDF and use it in the classroom, or you could even project it up on the, uh, on the wall to use, um, to use with the kids in the class. If you're 
bopping through these articles really quickly to find an article that you might want to use in class with the students, I'd suggest clicking on the HTML uh, full text link because this has no pictures. Uh, it's just text and it will load very quickly. Uh, and so you can quickly look, uh, decide whether the reading level is too high or the topic is too complicated or the delivery is too biased or whatever and maybe then go and look at another article. Um, the HTML of full text is sometimes the only format that's available with some of these articles and the reason for that is that EBSCO was able to negotiate um, the, the content of the article but not the pictures in the article because oftentimes pictures are um, sourced separately in magazines so they'll get the pictures from Getty's images or something like that and so EBSCO can't get the rights to reproduce the picture. They can only get the rights to reproduce the text. So uh, I think it's cheaper for them to get the HTML rather than the um, rather than the PDF full text. But in any case, uh, HTML will load faster. It's just not as pretty as far as that goes. So um, when you select the HTML, you get a whole bunch of different um, options that come up. PDF, of course, uh, is more like a picture, like a scan. So if, you've, uh, if you look at the HTML version, you can see that you have a bunch of choices. Um, every article can be printed or emailed uh, or saved to um, the desktop. You can export the bibliographic information in a bunch of different formats. And you can even add this to a research folder that you can create on the EBSCO servers. So a student who is maybe doing something over a few weeks might want to create an account on EBSCO separately. Um, and then they can, as they go through and find three or four or five or six useful articles, they can add them to their folder and then when they log back in again either from home or another session in school, all the articles they've chosen will be sitting there waiting for them. So it's a great way for them to organize their thinking. And uh, I should mention that uh, you know, if you're doing this kind of thing at the post-secondary level, um, you know, either as a, as a first, second, third year student or even as a grad student, um, these kinds of skills are handy and a student who leaves our system knowing a little bit about you know, how to search a database, how to find stuff, how to create folders, how to save stuff, this is something that is going to be able to transfer even if they're using you know, ProQuest or SIRS or any of the other databases. It, it, it all translates. Um, you'll see that there's what's called a persistent link. Uh, to this record. So the persistent link here is the, is the link that you will share on a website or uh, you, you send out an email to a teacher who's asking for an interesting article. You can email them this link and then when they click on the link it'll just simply ask them to, to log into the EBSCO server uh, with whatever credentials you have in your school and then they can view the article as is. And of course they have the option of going back and then getting the, the PDF full text as well. The other thing I like, and I just, I'll just have to mention this, is that all of the HTML articles will read to you. And so that's this little section down here. So uh, I, I make the joke that this is what Stephen Hawking does when he's not discovering black holes. It is machine read. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not a real person uh, in that sense reading to you. It's the, uh, it's the software that's, um, that's reading. Some of the words don't come out quite right. But I do find that if you switch the accent, then actually it seems it seems somehow more palatable. And the British accent just seems to be that much nicer. I don't know, but anyway. So uh, if you have a student who is text challenged, um, one of the uh, one of the things that will really be a help to them is to have the have the computer read the the text to them, and they can just plug the their earbuds in to the back of the the desktop computer or on a laptop, and you know off you go. Uh, from home, same thing. You know, maybe uh, the, the parents don't uh, are not uh, English as a first language speakers, and so maybe they can't get help from mom and dad to read through a text. Well, you, you know, you can have um, CPOV read it to you. So I think that's a great plus. I I believe it also gives you under the little um, the little wheel here. I believe it gives you the option of downloading the MP3 as well. So even for yourself, if you have a number of articles that you you know, maybe more scholarly articles that you would like to listen to, like to read, um, you could actually go and uh, download the MP3s of a bunch of them, put them on your iPod and then listen to them in the car on the way into work or what have you just to get on top of some of the reading without actually having to read, uh, read the text so that there's a, some opportunities there. 
Now, uh, I noticed that uh, one of the one of the participants today has the question: uh, Does this come in French? So, unfortunately, um, Canadian Points of View database uh, doesn't uh, doesn't read in French. Uh, it doesn't have the automatic translation feature either, and um, there's there's virtually no a database material in French that's available from a school perspective, and and I think. Uh, and, and here's the problem. There is a there is a French language database called Repair, which is used by a number of um, uh, high schools and colleges in Quebec. Uh, the problem with Repair is that the articles tend to be kind of like uh, you know Le Journal de l'Astrophysique Avancée or something, the Advanced Journal of Astrophysics or something. It's not at all really that useful for um, elementary or even high school for the most part. It's beyond uh, beyond most of us. And uh, the, the handful of French language resources that are in EBSCO at this point are things like chasse et pêche, you know, fishing and hunting, or uh, Chatelaine, the Chatelaine magazine, and I think there's one called uh, uh, Bellage or something, which is for the 50 plus uh, consumer. And there's a couple of other sort of Oh, is another one, which is sort of like a, a home, Canadian homemakers in French, and that's really about it. And so it's not really that useful for um, uh, for, for immersion programs. Really, there's the odd article that you might be able to use, but you know what? It's just unfortunately, it's not great. I did meet with um, um, I did uh, meet with the EBSCO fellow who. Uh, is responsible for Western Canada, and my uh, every time I, I see them, I say the same thing. But once again, this was just a couple of days ago. I said, you know, we need to have uh, more French language material in EBSCO. I said, it's not that they don't have magazines in French, and it's not that they don't have kids' magazines and adolescent magazines and popular media magazines in French. They've got them. It's just that at this point, nobody's going out and negotiating muscularly enough to get them. And I said to him, you know, we have immersion schools across the province, we have immersion schools across the country, and there is a need for this, and uh, school districts would pay for this. I mean, we have uh, um, federal money that, that we can put towards this, and uh, if, you know, if you build this French language database, we'll come to it. So anyway, off he was going to go to talk to his folks about that to see if there was some something they could do. But I mean, you know, there's Geo Ado and Fosfor and uh, Les Débrouillards and uh, L'Actualité. I mean, there's tons of magazines and newspapers in French. You know, uh, it's crazy that we don't have access to them. Anyway, that's my, my that's my little rant. Um, Arlene. Kathy has her hand up, and also uh, there was a request uh, just to confirm whether World Book was in French. Oh, right, okay. Um, yes, Arlene was just talking in my ear. So uh, World Book Online does have a French uh, version of their kids' encyclopedia, and so that's, um, uh, but that's not EBSCO, right? That's a different, uh, different vendor, different product, but they do have a French version of their kids' encyclopedia. They haven't translated the middle school encyclopedia or the advanced encyclopedia. Uh, and again, I've spoken to them about, you know, uh, what will it take to translate the middle school and the, the advanced one? Uh, and I said to the World Book vendor, look, you know, we're all looking for uh, a good, reliable, North American context, French language encyclopedia. Please, for heaven's sakes, will you not translate the middle school and the advanced encyclopedia? So, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, um, uh, we'll see something. Now, the, uh, Lindsay has a, has a great little uh, comment about uh, using the field code, uh, the language code, to, to pull stuff up in CPOV. And there is stuff there. I mean, you will find it. But um, um, my experience, at, so far with it anyway, is that the articles are not terribly useful. And the, the, the thing that makes the, uh, the CPOV so phenomenal is really the overview articles and, uh, and the for and against stuff. And so, you know, doing an individual search means that you don't get that sort of that cover page, which, you know, which, which is unfortunate. So anyway, um, I'll just kind of just move along here because I'm just uh, keeping an eye on the time. I don't want to there might be some questions, other additional questions. Um, many of the articles will include the Lexile value um, for uh, in terms of reading level, and so you know this is a 
formula that you know looks at sentence length and number of words and number of syllables per word and stuff like that. And then it just all that together creates a number, and then that number is uh, matched up as a number range to a grade level. And this is just sort of a, a rule of thumb, and um, you know there's no sort of uh, hard and fast rules about this, but. So this particular article, Animals Deserve Legal Rights, you can see that it's given a reading level of um, 1060. And so if we look at uh, the chart, if you click on the number, it actually pulls up the chart. So you don't have to memorize. I would say to people, you divide by 100 and then subtract 2.8. You, know, you, know, you can just click on it. It'll give you the chart. So you can see that this one is about, well, the 1050, so from about a grade 6 to maybe a grade 8 range kind of in there. But it really does depend on, on the, the, the context and the content. So um, an article that talks about something that the students have already looked at or that they are more likely to know, you've done a little work or maybe around vocabulary around the issues, you may find that a slightly higher reading level won't be a problem. If it's a if it's a uh, a topic that they haven't looked at at all and they don't have a clue, so maybe it's NAFTA, for example, the North American Free Trade um, uh, Agreement, and maybe the the reading level says, oh yeah, grade six, no problem. But you know, I mean, if the kids don't know what NAFTA is, it doesn't make it won't make any sense at all. So. Um, uh, so Lindsay has a question about um, about reading level generally. You know, I think that uh, I think it, I mean it's easy enough to get a machine generated reading level on these things, and I don't know why EBSCO doesn't have it on everything. And I have mentioned that the usefulness of this, just even as a just a general guide for a teacher, because you know you might find an article and you think, oh yeah. Uh, this is this is kind of zeros right in on the topic I'm looking at, and it might have like a 1400 um, lexile number on it, and you think, oh, okay, so 1400 is first year university. Maybe this is a little bit beyond my grade fives, right? So, and you know, not to say that you couldn't read it yourself and then use those ideas in a discussion or um, you know, in setting the frame for the kids, but it, it is nice to know a little bit about the the take on the article before you dive in with both feet. So, okay, so uh, let's just move on a little bit more. So now you can do independent searches on Canadian points of view, uh, which is fine. So if uh, in that search window I could type in anything I want and I could pull up stuff. But you'll notice the difference between the two screenshots that I put here. The top one is a search that doesn't use one of the preset issues. And so I'd still get, you know, Canadian magazines, international magazines, all that kind of thing. But uh, and in this case, whatever this topic was for videos, uh, this penal system I think I put in. But you'll notice in the second screen with the red arrow, if I do one using the preset searches, then what I will get is um, that points of view tab that comes up first, which gives me that overview that's so important. Um, um, that's such a key thing of this particular database. Um, so how are some of the ways that you could use a Canadian points of view with your, um, with your staff and your students and that kind of thing? One of the things that I think Canadian points of view is good for is uh, obviously for senior students, um, grades 11, 12 for sure, even I think you could start uh, kids at the grade 8 and up level using some of these things. Um, if they're um, doing uh, a topic for a debate, uh, they're wanting to look at some of the opinions around the topic. So you've looked at the fact stuff in class, and now you want to kind of move a little bit more into what are people thinking, what are the pros and cons, that kind of thing. Um, this is a, a, it's great for giving kids the sense of how it's possible to argue two sides of an issue. Because you know one of the reasons why all of these topics are controversial is because it is possible to, on the one hand, make a case for the topic using uh, lots of proof and and references and that kind of thing, and then on the flip side, uh, say no, I disagree, and here's why, and here's a good argument, and here's 
all the reasons and resources why I disagree with this topic. I mean, if there was no counter argument, then these wouldn't be controversial issues because it would be obvious. I mean, you know, cannibalism is bad. Right? <laughs> you really, there really is no other other argument for for something like that. However, you know, genetically modified organisms or uh, issues around uh, Aboriginal people and gun control and monarchy and, and media bias, and so these are all all topics that have some for and against issue. I just picked a few at random and just uh, looked to see where they might fit. And so, you know, in a science class where you're dealing with some of these topics, you could find some very interesting um, uh, articles to use with your students, either as, a, as an entry point or as a follow-up position or something like that. Um, under socials, uh, you know, you're studying Quebec or women's rights or Aboriginal people or gun control or the monarchy or something like that. In an English class, you might be doing a lit circle uh, where the theme might be poverty or homelessness or violence. Why not look to see what the overview of that uh, of that topic, that, that issue is from a Canadian perspective, just to give some, some anchoring, some framework for that topic before you launch into doing the novel study. Um, I think what this does is it gives us a little bit more of a sense of what's going on in Canada because, you know, like it or not, we tend to be influenced hugely by what's happening south of the border. We see it in the media, we, we hear it, it's in the movies and that kind of thing. And, and in some cases, we tend to be a little bit less on top of the Canadian perspective, or at least the kids are not on top of the Canadian perspective, and in, in some cases, we're not either. And so, you know, and I think, you know, what do you actually know about bioethics in Canada, or NAFTA, or drug policy in Canada, or Arctic drilling from a Canadian perspective? We often hear about that from a, an American perspective. The overview topic is is ideal for that. I think it, 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 that article, that position paper, gives you a sense of what the big questions are. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you will be Einstein when you uh, when you uh, finish reading uh, the article, but what it does do is it gives you a good grounding, uh, even if it's not something that you would want to use directly with the students in the class. For teachers who have changed a grade level or picking up a, uh, a subject area they're not feeling 100% on or they're doing a new unit, these overview um, articles just, they give you a bit of a grounding in what the issues are and, and what things you might want to explore a little bit more with your class. So, um, okay, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, can I can I just show you? Uh, can we just pick a topic and look at, uh, at look at that in a little bit more detail, or were some other questions? Uh, just looking here at the chat. Some examples of magazines available. Well, I, I can show you that if you like. Uh, if we can just take a look at one of the um, the topics. Oh, Embridge Pipeline. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's just see if I can pull up this. Um, um, I just uh, actually I was just going to pick uh, um, something that might be sort of more Canadian than anything else. But so l let me just let me just show you um, how uh, what one of these looks like. So I've just picked multiculturalism as a topic just to see because if you look up multiculturalism uh, from an American perspective or you just Google multiculturalism, you might not get um, sort of the Canadian perspective that you're looking for. You might end up with a um, with the U.S. perspective. So multiculturalism, the overview. So here's, here's our, our, our text here. Um, so uh, uh, what you get is, uh, you know, the result list here. Um, you've got, I can actually play it in a British accent if I like, or I think I have some choices here. I can choose Australian too. I kind of like the Australian accent, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, so, so this is a similar layout to what you'll see in, in all of the articles. So it gives a little bit of an overview about what multiculturalism is, what it means from a Canadian perspective. We have some historical things here happening. So in the 1970s this happened, uh, and then, you know, how we how we represent hyphenated citizenship. Then there's some vocabulary that you're likely to come across when you're talking about um, multiculturalism, bicultural, bilingual, uh, monoculture, reasonable accommodation, those kinds of things. Uh, then a bit of a history lesson. So uh, what's the multicultural perspective in Canada? Uh, kind of walks you through. Uh, then talks about multiculturalism today. 
Uh, it has things like uh, the, uh, the Quebecois student who brought a Kirpan to school and what happened. We've got the issues with the, um, the uh, RCMP having the right to wear uh, a, a turban. So there's a whole bunch of things here that are fairly, uh, fairly recent. I mean, you, you might not find this in a, in a book. But you would, it's nicely written up here. Um, uh, it actually, I think the the last reference here, um, you know, talk about the, uh, the September 11th and some of the things that happened around that, and then what's that done in Canada, and then we have 2006 reference to uh, um, Harper apologizing for the Chinese head tax, um, and so this is a this is a great overview of the situation. You can see at the bottom there's a great bibliography of material. Um, and then some additional links, and then just a little blurb about the author and the co-author of the um, um, uh, of, of this article. So this is actually quite nice. Now you can see on the side here we've got a link to the before multiculturalism or some aspect of multiculturalism, and then the counterpoint article. Um, we also have a guide to the critical analysis, which we'll take a look at in a moment. And then we have a couple of other articles here that they pulled out. You know, uh, Canadian style multiculturalism doesn't work in Quebec. Another article, the disc continuities of multiculturalism, um, and then some of the research guides here down the side. So this is actually quite uh, quite interesting stuff. Um, how are the writers and authors selected? So EBSCO uh, looks for uh, Canadians uh, who have written on this topic uh, before and contracts them to write uh, a little bit of an overview. So they might be scientists, they might be um, commentator, uh, political commentators, they might be uh, people working in the, the, the area of the humanities. Um, and so the, they'll get someone to write the overview topic, and then they'll find people who feel one way or the other on the topic, and then ask them to write the point or the counterpoint article. And if we just take a quick look at, the, at one of these articles here, so if we look at the point article, for example. So if we um, uh, scroll right through to the bottom, you can see that there's a bunch of uh, references as well at the bottom of this article, as, as well as some websites. So um, and so you can see here's the here's the thing that tells you about who the person is or the people that are writing the article. So you get a sense of of, of where this comes from. Um, and uh, I think it's just all very interesting, um, both for students and for teachers to look at. The credit the guide to critical analysis. We'll just take one one quick look at that. So the guide to critical analysis. Um, so again, uh, this is a little bit boilerplate, so you see, you'll see a lot of the same kinds of things. Um, so what to do before you start reading the article, so it gives you kind of a walk through of what, what to do. And then it gives you some things to do while you're reading, so taking some notes, take a look at the terms. Uh, see if you can organize the ideas that you're pulling out of the part that you're reading. They have a little section on judging fact and opinion. So this part is the same in all of the critical guides, but the examples that they give are uh, examples that relate to multiculturalism uh, as opposed to gun control or whatever the other thing is. And then uh, at the end they give you just a few more things to think about uh, the topic and uh, a little bit about you know if you're going to debate it, uh, what might you say. Okay. Right. So making a student account up he, up here in the top uh, um, section when you when you come to the main, we we'll just go back to the main page here. I'll just let it uh, just load up here. So you have uh, the sign in section. So if I click on sign in, what it's going to do is it's going to ask me to put in my username and password. If I don't have one already, then there's just a little button beside here that says uh, create a new account. Uh, and then you can uh, fill in some information, so name, email, address, username, uh, come up with a password, a secret question in case you forget, and then you save the changes. Primarily what this does is this allows you to email yourself things, because once you've logged in, of course, uh, then uh, it makes it easy to log in things. And it also helps keep track of, you know, these are the three articles I found that are really good on this. So I can tag those and tuck them away um, in, my, um, in my folder. Uh, and then I can come back to it later and then um, uh, you know, I can add or, or subtract or if I find a better one or what have you. So it's, it's just handy. It's not required because you can do the searching. You can even email 
without necessarily having an account. I mean, you don't have to have an account to do that. But what it does do is it just gives you that um, the ability to save a folder, and it also gives you the ability to um, to ask EBSCO to email you when there's new articles on the topic. So, um, okay, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty much, pretty much all the stuff that I was going to say. Um, uh, let me just. Uh, I just go back. Yeah, and it's the same account for all the ESCO databases because this, as I said, is just a front door uh, to um, to EBSCO, if you'll remember. And so, um, uh, so if you're creating an account on Canadian points of view, you're creating it in all of the all of the for all all of EBSCO. Um, so anyway, we're back to the multiculturalism. You can see this Canadian magazines, and so they sort these by relevance. Um, so there's Canada and the World Backgrounder. There's the Canadian Diversity Magazine. Um, a lot of these are from that one. There's uh, Maclean's. Uh, there's Alberta Views. So there's a number of these. So these are sorted by relevance. The newspaper articles are uh, are sorted by default by date descending. So we have uh, here's a um, uh, here's an article that's from today's paper, right? Um, um, you know, the Kitchener record or whatever, the, you know, et cetera. Um, and then they have under reference books for this particular topic, there's a bunch of things. Um, you know, this book before Canada, uh, uh, this book, uh, this chapter out of the book called Canada. Um, and they have some other articles written. There's a biographies tab. There's a radio and TV news transcript tab. Um, so this pulls up something from just this month um, on CBC television. And then in this case, we have some images. In some cases, you've got videos um, and other resources available. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Gordon, for again helping us along with, uh, with the job that we do. You are very generous with your time. We certainly appreciate it. Um, and I would like to remind everybody of the next session, which is part two of squeezing the juice out of EBSCO Novelist Plus with Lindsay Roth on March the 5th. And we also have um, a winner to announce for our draw. Um, everyone who got their names in before the 15th of February, uh, excuse me, including the 15th of February, and I, I noticed there were some late night people who got, uh, who registered, um, <clears throat> their names were put into a hat and my husband selected the name enough so that we know that it was purely uh, proper and accurate. And the winner is Catherine Gerard. And I'm not sure if Catherine is with us right now. I don't think so, but we will let her know. So the winner of our uh, draw for an iPad mini is Catherine Gerard. So I will uh, turn off my mic so Gordon can say anything you want at the end, but um, I would like just to take this opportunity again to thank Gordon and to remind you that the next session is March 5th. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope that uh, you uh, picked up a few pointers. Uh, for me, the, the trick is to pick one thing at a time just to make sure that I don't overwhelm my teachers. Uh, and uh, hopefully, once they see how great one of the resources is, they'll want to go back and see uh, where the other ones uh, are and how they might use them. And for me, the trick is to find usually to find one thing if I'm going into a school and I know that they're all working on, you know, pick something. If I can tie my presentation to that, then they're they're all happy campers. So thank you, everyone. I'm ho hoping you got a few uh, pointers for your um, uh, for your presentations, both the staff and uh, your work that you do with students. And uh, uh, good luck with uh, good luck with squeezing the juice out of ESCO.